good. Um, welcome everybody to uh, the first colloquium of the new semester. Uh, and of course, we're starting off this colloquium um, in the virtual mode. We'll be resuming our in-person colloquium uh, next week, I think is true, Mitch, right? We're going yes, to... yeah, we, we have an in, a person who is actually already physically in Boulder next week. Okay, all right. Well, we're really, we're thrilled to have uh, Professor Steve Ferlinetto from uh, UCLA join us uh, today. Um, Steve and I have worked together for uh, over a decade now. Um, Steve has been a part of our NASA funded team called the Network for Exploration and Space Science or NES for short. Um, it's a part of the SERVI Institute, which is the Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute. Sorry for all the acronyms. Um, but we've worked together collaboratively in particular working on uh, issues of 21 centimeter uh, cosmology and looking at um, opportunities for observations uh, from the moon. Some of those observations are going to be realized just in a few months. Later this spring, our first radio telescope is due to uh, land on the moon uh, as part of NASA's commercial payload services program. So we're uh, excited um, uh, by that in the beginning of, um, of this new uh, era. So Steve received his uh, PhD from Harvard University, worked with uh, Abby Loeb there. Uh, in fact, uh, more recently, he and Avi have published a, a book called First Galaxies in the Universe, which was published, I think, around 2013 or so, Steve. I think that's, I think that's, that's right. Correct. So yep. it's been a very well-received book. It's, a, it's kind of a graduate-level textbook. I give it to all my students, certainly if you're in getting started um, in this field. So um, I uh, highly recommend that. Um, after finishing up his PhD at Harvard, he had a postdoctoral fellowship at Caltech, uh, did a brief position at Yale University before moving over to UCLA in, as a faculty member in 2009. Uh, his awards include a, a Sloan Fellowship, a Packard Fellowship, a Simons Fellowship, and also he received the Warner Prize from the um, American Astronomical Society. Uh, and one of the things Steve reminded me, because I was there for his Warner Prize lecture, a plenary talk, uh, is that in his slides, in each slide, he had a uh, quote from Shakespeare, uh, which is a bit unusual for um, an astronomy talk. So, Steve, I thought maybe we start off with a quote from Shakespeare today here that maybe is appropriate for the times that we live in today. A very famous quote that most everybody knows. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. And as I said, this is appropriate for our times and gives us a little uh, motivation in thinking for it. So once again, Steve, we're very pleased to uh, have you with us today to talk about first galaxies. And so I'm gonna turn the virtual floor over to you now. Thanks, Jack. Um, and thanks for inviting me. It is a pleasure to see you all, even if only on Zoom. I do wish I could be there, um, but hopefully soon I will make it to Boulder. Okay, so let me get my screen set up here. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about the first generations of galaxies in the universe and how we hope to learn about them in the very near future now. Um, so just to give some orientation, this is a timeline history of the universe with the Big Bang at the left and the present day at the right. And the aspect of cosmology that is most exciting to me is uncovering the story of how we got from the very simple universe following the Big Bang to the complex structures we see around us today. And uncovering that story, uh, there's a number of ways to attack it, of course. So the first thing one can imagine doing is looking around us today and seeing where, what the endpoint is, where we are going, aiming for. And of course, if you look at the universe around us today, the vast majority of stars are inside of galaxies. There are basically two types of galaxies that each obey well-defined scaling relations. Those galaxies are growing relatively slowly um, and interacting with each other relatively rarely. So I think of this as the mature phase of galaxy formation that we are in today. 
Over the past 25 years or so, one of the big efforts has been to push our understanding of galaxies as far back in time as we can. And these days you can study galaxies in some detail uh, out to about a billion years after the Big Bang. And when we look at these sources, we see that they are growing more rapidly, but they are smaller than, than present day galaxies. They are interacting with each other more violently. And so I think of these as kind of the angry teenage years of galaxy evolution. But if we look at these sources, they're kind of fundamentally the same as the ones we see today. They're made of the same kinds of stars and governed by the same processes. The other thread you can pursue is by looking at the beginning. Uh, the, or the closest to the Big Bang we can get is the cosmic microwave background, which last scattered about 400,000 years after the Big Bang. And people who study the CMB are fond of referring to it as a baby picture of the universe, which is true. But for those of us who study galaxies, they weren't around yet, right? The universe at that time was uniform to about one part in 100,000. Nevertheless, those tiny fluctuations would eventually become galaxies. And so I think of the CMB as the DNA of galaxies. The big hole that's left here in the middle is fast, a fascinating era, though, because it is going to be the era in which galaxies are first born and grow up to be the kind of normal-ish looking things we see a billion years after the Big Bang. And this is the era that we're all hoping to pursue um, and that I want to tell you about uh, today. All right, so for some vocabulary, we often refer to this era with a couple of different terms. So I use the phrase dark ages to refer to the universe after the CMB last scattered, but before the first stars appeared. So this, like the CMB, is a tool for cosmology. The universe was really simple back then, we think. And so any sort of deviations from our expectations are signatures of exotic physics, like complicated dark matter models or primordial black holes or cosmic strings or something like that. And for that reason, Astro 2020 highlighted this as one of the key discovery areas in cosmology over the next N years. Once the first stars form, they light up the universe. And so we refer to that era as cosmic dawn, okay? Now we will get back to the first stars a little bit later, but for now I want to emphasize that the, these first luminous structures to form in the universe were likely very different than the kinds of galaxies and stars we see today. Right? These stars we think formed um, at around a redshift of 30. So we don't haven't seen these at all. So this is just a model, but the plot is showing an estimate of it in you know, one corner of parameter space what the history of these population three first stars would look like. So the y-axis is the star formation rate density of the universe, and the x-axis is time or redshift. So early times are at the right in this plot. And the red curve shows the star formation rate density of the population three first stars, right? So it's taking off, you know, around a redshift of 30, and it's ending probably quite early as well. The other thing to keep in mind about these is that they form in very small dark matter halos, very tiny little clusters of stars that are going to be very, very hard to see. All right. Cosmic Dawn doesn't really have as well-defined an endpoint as, as that, as it begins, but usually we refer to its endpoint as what's called reionization. Uh, reionization is a process by which these first galaxies affect all of the baryons in the universe. So imagine our first clumps of stars starting to form. Some of those stars are hot and produce ionizing photons. And some of those ionizing photons leak out into the universe around them and create little H2 regions, little ionized bubbles. As we get more and bigger galaxies, those bubbles grow and merge and eventually fill the universe. So what you're seeing here, zoom willing, is a computer simulation of how that process may have unfolded. So the blue stuff are these ionized bubbles and the black blobs are the neutral gas that's left over in the intergalactic medium. Right, we are very much still learning about this transition, but the data shows, uh, suggests anyway, that it ends somewhere around a billion years after the Big Bang. So that's a redshift of six. And then it happened fairly quickly, all right? So the universe was roughly half ionized at redshift of seven or about 800, 850 million years after the Big Bang. Okay, so in this talk, I wanna kind of go over what we know about the universe in this era and how we are learning from it and we'll learn from it in the future, okay? So there are gonna be three basic sections. We're gonna start off by talking about what we think we know about how galaxies um, operated during the cosmic dawn. So most of our data at this point comes from the Hubble Space Telescope and especially deep fields like the UDF that I'm showing here. 
And with the UDF and goods and other deep surveys, we have now collected um, or found a roughly a thousand uh, sources above a redshift of six, so during this reinization era. And their luminosity functions are shown in the plot at the left, right? And so, you know, the error bars are not small, right? But they're pretty good. And so we have a pretty good handle on how many bright galaxies there are in the universe and how that is changing over this era. And the first thing one can ask is, does this show anything uh, interesting, anything different about how these early sources are evolving? So I like to think of this from kind of a bottom-up perspective. And so we're going to start off with the simplest possible galaxy model I can think of. Our galaxies are going to form inside of dark matter halos or gravitationally bound clumps. The, because of their potential wells, those dark matter halos accrete matter from their surroundings, right, including gas. And as that gas falls onto the galaxy, they can, it can form stars. Right? But inevitably, when you form stars, you also get feedback. By feedback, I mean stuff like radiation from the stars uh, that's exerting pressure on, its, on the surrounding material, or supernovae from massive stars exploding shortly after they form. And all of this energy that gets dumped back into the environment is going to push back on the gas, and it's going to cause some of it to get kicked out of the galaxy. All right. And so if we want to understand how efficiently galaxies form stars, in this very simple picture, we basically have one thing to worry about, and that's how does feedback work. Now, unfortunately, feedback is extremely complicated, and there's no good first principles model that will explain how it works. So we can, uh, but, but we do know that basically the general, you know, your estimate, qu uh, quick and dirty estimates of how efficient feedback should be do work reasonably well at explaining star forming galaxies at later times. So let's take those same sort of basic quick and dirty estimates and apply them here. What does that look like for an individual galaxy? All right, here I'm showing the, tr the growth of one galaxy over time, according to this very simple model. So the bottom panel, the dotted curve is showing the mass of the dark matter halo, okay, in which the galaxy forms. And now redshift, um, time, early times are at the left here and late times are at the right. And so you can see that this dark matter halo is growing by a lot, right? It's growing by four orders of magnitude and mass roughly over this span. And the solid black curve is the, st the stellar mass inside the system, right? And it is also growing rapidly, roughly paralleling the growth of the galaxy, or of the halo, excuse me. In the top panel, I'm basically removing the overall growth of the dark matter. So I'm taking the mass in stars and normalizing it to the total um, mass in the halo. Okay, and you can see that basically in this picture, after some initial adjustment phase, a constant fraction of the incoming gas is turned into stars, and that is just determined by what you assume about this feedback parameter. In the red curve, I make the feedback 10 times stronger, and that means you need 10 times fewer stars to kick out all the gas, and so you form fewer stars, all right? Now, this sounds like a really simple kind of dumb model, but with this level, we can fit the observed luminosity functions of these galaxies reasonably well using the same kind of feedback models that work at lower redshift. So the data points in this plot are the same as in the, as I showed before with the luminosity functions. And now the curves are ver flavors of this model, all right, using, assuming slightly different things about feedback, but all, you know, getting in the ballpark of the observations. So what this is telling us is there's no strong evidence that these galaxies work any differently than star forming galaxies later on. Now, one may worry that that's because the model is so crude. So we can start you know, making the model fancier and seeing what it tells us about how these galaxies evolve. All right, so the next level of detail one might imagine is we've got our gas coming in and it is not going to immediately form stars. Instead, it forms the interstellar medium. All right, and then through complicated processes, stars condense out of that interstellar medium, create feedback and kick gas back out. All right, so with this, once we add an interstellar medium, it's known as a bathtub or regulator model, depending on whose version you read first. And this has an extra parameter to it, which is the efficiency with which stars can form out of that reservoir of gas. Okay, so this is what we would think of as the star formation efficiency of like molecular clouds. All right, so what happens when we add this? All right, well, it actually doesn't change the model much at all, all right? So I've added a new curve to the plot that I showed you, or a few couple of new curves. 
Now the thin lines are showing how the gas mass, the mass of the interstellar medium is evolving, all right? And it's in the top panel, you can see that it is roughly a constant fraction of the gas available to the halo, all right? Um, and again, if we crank up the feedback to the red curve, nothing changes, okay? What about that second parameter? So feedback has a strong effect on how these galaxies evolve. What about the second parameter, the quote unquote star formation efficiency? Here now, the blue dot dashed curve is increasing the, the rate at which stars can condense from the interstellar medium by a factor of almost 10, right? And you can see the thick curves again show the, the stellar mass and that is essentially unchanged, right? The, in these models, the star formation all right, is basically determined by feedback, and the gas in the galaxy will adjust so that it can make the right the, the number of stars that feedback tells it to make. So the thin blue curve here is the fraction in the gas phase, and that does decline because you need less gas around to make stars when the star formation process is more efficient. So what this tells us is that when we're studying the buildup of stellar mass in galaxies, we're not learning about star formation inside of you know, gaseous ISM, we're learning about feedback. Now, one might still worry that this is because the model is too simple. Right? And indeed, right, star formation is more complicated than one parameter. What we think really happens is we have our ISM, and out of that ISM, some kind of fragmentation occurs, and we get cold clouds, which are molecular clouds in today's galaxies. Then stars form through gravitational collapse in those molecular clouds. Stars live their lives and produce feedback. Some of that feedback triggers galaxy outflows, but some of it actually goes back into the interstellar medium and stirs it up. And by stirring up the gas, we're supporting it against farther collapse. All right, so you reach this limit where feedback is essentially regulating, at least in part, uh, the formation of, of, of stars inside of galaxies. Now, the, this cycle, I think, is pretty well, most people would agree that that's what's happening. The details of the cycle are very controversial, all right? But what I did was I took four different prescriptions for how this cycle works inside of galaxies and put them all inside this model. And they all give roughly the same result for the growth of the stellar mass, all right? That feedback is what controls the growth of the galaxies, or at least the stellar mass. Um, and the star formation is controlling that how much gas you have left over or sitting around. So the nice thing about this kind of bottom-up approach is it gives us a way of understanding what might be going on with the galaxies that we can't see, right? Because we've kind of established the physics of how these galaxies are working. So we use it to extrapolate and make predictions for what future surveys of earlier times and smaller galaxies are going to find, which is perfect timing because, of course, JWST. So this plot is trying to illustrate the, the importance of these extrapolations, okay? All right, so the x-axis is apparent magnitude. The idea is we're gonna think of a given survey that's out to some depth, all right? So each of the vertical lines on this plot are correspond to a different fictitious survey. And then the y-axis is showing the fraction of star formation that occurs in galaxies brighter than the specified limit, okay? Rel so it's the fraction relative to the to total amount of star formation in the universe. And the curve to pay the, the survey to pay attention to is the second one here, right? The second, uh, the rightmost dot dashed line, which is close to the deepest planned JWST survey in cycle one. All right. And now the different curves are for different redshifts. So at redshift of eight, that's the topmost blue curve, right? And this survey is going to do pretty well. It's going to get more than half of the star formation in the universe. All right. Because most of it's happening in relatively bright galaxies. But as we go to earlier times, the situation looks a little dicier, right? At redshift of 10, we're only seeing about a quarter of the star formation. At redshift of 15, we're only going to get a couple of percent of it. And that's because as you go to earlier times, they're farther away, of course. Um, but even more important is that the average mass of the galaxies is going down. And so more and more of the action is happening in very faint systems that we can't see. And of course, if we're not actually able to see those, then we need to ask whether the extrapolations that I'm doing here are reasonable or not. And there are good reasons to believe that those extrapolations are going to break, right? So I want to describe two that are both interesting. One is 
may sound a little bit prosaic. The other one is very exotic. Okay, so this is the cycle in the interstellar medium that I described. And remember that the feedback from the stars is balancing fragmentation so that we're kind of controlling, regulating the, the star formation efficiency. In order for that balance to occur, the feedback has to operate quickly enough to kick in, all right? So we have to look at time scales. Most of our feedback is coming from massive stars, all right? And so the, 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 the component of the feedback in supernovae, at least, has a delay relative to the time the star is formed of you know, 10 or 20 million years, depending on how massive your star is. Okay, if the left half or the right half, um, the fragmentation half can occur faster than that time scale, then the feedback is not gonna be able to catch up and do this regulation, all right? So what's the limiting time scale it turns out to be the first step, all right? The cold cloud formation that occurs on, it's a gravitational fragmentation process. So it occurs on the roughly the orbital time of the system little bit smaller than that. So for the Milky Way today, that free fall time is of order 100 million years, comfortably longer than the stellar evolution time scale. And so we imagine that this feedback should be easy to establish. But for a galaxy at redshift of 10, that free fall time is going to be of order 5 million years, right? And so you can evolve through a few fragmentation timescales before the supernovae are able to sort of kick in and try to start regulating. And so if you just change this very simple picture I described by one thing, which is adding a delay to the, the feedback, you get dramatically different results, all right? So here is what we saw before, right? Just to remind you, we get steady growth of the galaxy and basically a constant fraction of the available gas turns into stars that is independent of that small scale efficiency. Here's what happens if you allow for a delay, all right? Basically, the, the first half, the fragmentation part, proceeds before feedback can kick in, and you get this runaway, bursty star formation. And then you get a ton of feedback that clears out the gas, and you have to wait for the gas to be able to reaccumulate to start the cycle again. Okay, And so you get bursts, these oscillations. The solid curve is using the star formation, the small scale star formation efficiency that we think is appropriate for galaxies like the Milky Way. The, Red curve uses a slower star formation efficiency. The blue curve uses a faster one. And so you can see that in the equilibrium assumption, that small scale star formation efficiency made no difference. Now it is hugely important, okay? So we're changing not only how many stars we're forming, but we're actually changing the way in which the, the kind of physics that controls star formation. Now, what the interesting thing to look at, or one of the interesting things is the black curve, right? I get these oscillations early on, that it's at early times when the galaxy is very small, but they damp out, okay, by the time the galaxy is large. And so it basically turns out that with that sort of standard assumption, the kinds of galaxies that we can see today with HST, most of those that we will see with JWST, will not have these kind of bursty behavior, at least for this reason. Um, they will have settled into the normal scaling, but the unseen galaxies can be very different, and that's something to worry about. All right, the second and probably more exciting reason to expect small halos to break from our assumptions is that the population three stars that I mentioned earlier, the first stars to form in the universe. So these form in very, very small dark matter clumps, um, orders of magnitude smaller than the Milky, than, yeah, than the Milky Way, many orders of magnitude. Um, and they form a different way, right? Stars in present day galaxies, in order to get to high densities, they rely on metal line cooling but metals weren't around after the Big Bang until you'd had a few generations of stars. And so these stars use molecular hydrogen cooling, which is less efficient and probably leads to more massive stars, although how much more massive is up for debate. But anytime you have massive stars, you get even more feedback, right? And so these stars that form in tiny halos have tons of feedback, which blow apart their halos, possibly also other nearby halos. Um, and it turns out they also set up a, um, large scale self-regulation, which is through the, their ultraviolet background. So these early hot stars produce a UV background. It turns out that UV background can dissociate the molecular hydrogen that you're using to make your stars in the first place and stop more pop three stars from forming, okay? And this kind of will control things until we get enough galaxies growing kind of big enough to ignore molecular hydrogen and form stars in a more normal way. 
So this is the plot I showed you near the beginning of one model's view of the history of these population three stars, right? So time, early times are at the right now. Um, and then the y-axis is the star formation rate density. The red curve are these population three stars. So they get going very early, right? Redshifts of 30. And you can see they level off. And that's because this UV background is forming, all right, which is sort of slowing down how many more uh, population three star forming regions you can develop. Meanwhile, some of these halos are growing to sort of normal galaxy size. And so the black, uh, blue dot dashed curve are the normal galaxies that dominate at late times, right? So in order to probe um, these population three stars, you really need to go to very early times and very, very small dark matter clumps that are gonna be basically invisible to conventional tel telescopes. So it may sound depressing, all right, but there is a way around it, of course. And that is to use their collective effects, right? So remember the reionization process that I mentioned a while ago, um, that is driven by the integrated light from all of the galaxies in the universe, right? It does, even if the galaxy is, galaxies are small individually, their collective effects are what is ionizing all of this intergalactic material. And so the basic idea is we get the bright galaxies with JWST by looking at them individually. We use reionization or other radiation backgrounds to learn about all of the galaxies together. We subtract out the ones we can see, and then we're left with some constraints on what's going on in these um, tiny unobserved clumps that are most interesting. All right, so the rest of the talk, I'm gonna explain two ways that we, we do that. All right, one of them is sort of a proof of concept that we can already do it. And then the other is looking forward to how we will do it much better in the future. All right, so I'm gonna focus now on reionization. All right, um, again, we take all of our sources, okay? They are collectively ionizing the universe. And so if we wanna build a model of how reionization proceeds, we need to build a model of how these sources work. And that's a complicated business, but I'm gonna break it into some pieces. So the first part is we need to know which halos form stars, right? Which are able to form stars. The second part is how efficient are they at forming stars? And this, these two are sort of what I've been describing so far. Um, X star is this parameter for how much of the available gas a halo is able to turn into stars. We need to know more than that, though. We need to know how well those stars produce ionizing photons. Okay, so we need to know what metallicity the stars are forming at, what their initial mass function is, stuff like that, in order to get the number of ionizing photons they are producing. And then we also, oops, and then we also need to know how many of those ionizing photons are able to get out of their galaxy into the intergalactic medium and contribute to reionization. Now, this is called the escape fraction, and it is very hard, well, it's very, very hard to model because there's a, you need to sort of get the geometry of your galaxy right. And it's also very hard to observe, unfortunately, but people have worked hard to look at this in galaxies at redshifts of four or below, basically. And the key thing to keep in mind for this talk is that everybody who does that basically finds that the escape fraction is very small. It's a few percent when you're averaging across at least a whole population. There are, of course, individual galaxies that appear to have high ones, but they are, those are rare. All right, so the escape fraction appears to be quite small in all the systems that we can study. So those kinds of parameters give you the sources, how many ionizing photons you are producing, um, the next thing you need to know is how many of those actually manage to ionize new material in the intergalactic medium, as opposed to getting absorbed along their paths by clumps in the intergalactic medium, All right? So we need some, met some model for basically how many photons you waste by passing through dense clumps that are you know, on their way to forming galaxies or something like that. All right, so all of these are unknown, okay? but they're all important for the process. I wanna illustrate um, the last one, the clumpiness of the IGM. The way we describe this is with a mean free path. So how far on average can an ionizing photon travel before it gets absorbed by one of these clumps? So in this plot, we are holding the source models constant, right? All we are varying is how much clumpiness there is expressed through this mean free path. So in this case, early times are at the right, late times are at the left, and I'm plotting the neutral fraction. So at early times, the universe is mostly neutral before reionization. At times, it is going towards zero. Okay, so the 
um, bottom curve, which is red down here, basically assumes that there are no clumps, right? The clumps are very, very widely spaced, 160 megaparsecs across. And in that case, right, if, with this model, reionization would end around redshift to six and a half, right? But as we crank up the clumpiness or decrease the mean free path, it gets harder and harder to reionize the universe, right? And in this purple, reionization would actually be delayed until after a redshift of five, right? And that is what we used to think was a very clumpy interstellar medium um, with a mean free path of 10 megaparsecs, okay? All right, so we're gonna use, what we wanna do is by figuring out when reionization ended then, put some joint constraint on these parameters, All right, That's kind of the goal. The way we usually, the, the most, I don't know if it's the best way, um, but the, the way that it's been most practical so far is to use quasars through the Lyman Alpha Forest. So imagine that this purple star is a very luminous quasar positioned beyond the edge of reionization. And then it's throwing it, sending its photons toward us along the white line. As those photons travel through the universe, they get redshifted. And for a photon that begins in the ultraviolet, it can redshift into the Lyman alpha resonance of neutral hydrogen. And if there is neutral hydrogen around when it does that, it will get absorbed, right? And so we will see a, an absorption trough in the spectrum of the quasar. So conceptually, this sounds great, all right? So if the light from this photon travels through this residual neutral blob, the black blob in the middle here, okay? then there's neutral hydrogen around and we will absorb the light and see an absorption trough, okay? Unfortunately, it turns out that there's so much neutral hydrogen around that even in the ionized blobs during reionization, we will get a high opacity and see an absorption trough as well. So we're not able to study the sort of middle phases of reionization with this, but there, is, there has long been hope that we could understand the end of reionization with it, all right? And so the conventional wisdom for the, a long time was let's map out the overall absorption in the slime and alpha forest. And when it starts to go up quickly, that would signal the end of reionization. And that's what's plotted here. So redshift on the x-axis and the optical depth of chunks of these spectra to the lime and alpha transition on the y-axis. And so from redshift four to about five and a half, we get this smooth increase in the average, and then it starts to shoot up. And so the end of reionization was taken to be around redshift of six, all right? But that ignored something very important in this plot, which is that there are these, there's actually a wide dispersion in the optical depths as well, okay? So there's not a wide dispersion at redshift of four, but if you look up here at redshift of five and a half, we start to get these regions that have very, very high absorption, all right? And here's a couple of those, okay? These are both at redshift of 5.7-ish, all right? And um, yeah, there, so there are two Lyman alpha forest spectra plotted here, um, and they both have these long gaps, okay, of very deep absorption, which are equivalent to about 100 megaparsec path lengths. But around them, there is substantial transmission, right? So this is the variations that I'm that I was referring to. Now it turns out these variations are so big that they cannot be explained by a standard model of the ionizing background. So they're telling us something about how reionization is ending. The question is what? All right, to answer that, we did a survey to see what the environment of these big troughs are, All right? So um, look at, we basically took a narrow band filter to look for line emitting galaxies that are in this gray band here. Now these are 100 megaparsec chunks. There sh should be very big features. And so we want a very big camera to do that or a very wide angle camera. And so we're using Hyper C Prime Cam on Subaru and looking to see what the galaxy environments of these um, particular regions are. And these bullseyes show that. So the quasar in each case is the yellow dot at the center, all right? And then each of the points in the diagram is a galaxy found with this technique. And visually, you can probably see that there is a more or less a, a hole in the galaxy distribution around each of the quasars, all right? With lots more galaxies farther out. And quantitatively that is plotted here. So this is as a function of distance from the projected distance from the quasar, it is the surface density of these line emitting galaxies. And you see that it's small in the parts nearest to the quasar and then reaches an average farther out. So that's telling us that these are under dense regions of the universe, all right? Galaxy voids basically, 
Now, the question that is currently unresolved is whether we get this absorption because the IgM is fluctuating, the, the ionizing background is fluctuating very strongly in these voids, or because they're still neutral and reionization hasn't quite ended even at redshift of 5.7. We don't know, we can't tell the difference between those yet, all right, but we're hoping that with more observations and better models, we can do so soon. The second thing we can do with these quasars is measure the clumpiness. All right, so with the quasar spectra, you can figure out how far an ionizing photon can propagate in the universe. And people have studied this for many years at lower redshifts. So this is a plot of the mean free path of these ionizing photons right, as a function of redshift. And it's, de it's decreasing toward early times, but decreasing in a you know, fairly slow steady out to redshift of five. George Becker recently though measured this mean free path at redshift of six and found that it basically falls off a cliff, okay? It declines by about an order of magnitude, albeit with fairly large errors, which tells us that the universe is much more clumpy than we had expected at the end of reionization. And remember that makes reionization harder to finish because you're wasting more photons, all right? So what can that, so, so now let's say we know that reionization is finishing, you know, somewhere around 5.7 or 6, and that the universe is very clumpy. Now let's try to use that to learn about the galaxy population. Okay, so here are puzzle pieces for a reionization model. I'm going to assume that the halo masses and the star formation efficiencies of these galaxies are known for now. We don't really know that, all right, but just to show you how this process works. Um, and I want to think of what we can learn about the other three parameters. So again, the clumpiness is measured by this mean free path, all right, which is on the x-axis. The blue vertical blue dashed line is that best fit measurement I just showed you. And the blue band are the uncertainties on that. The stellar populations are telling us basically how good are our stars at producing ionizing photons. And a parameter describing that, which I don't want to get into the details of, is the y-axis. All right, the key point is that in a, a couple of people have tried to measure this for relatively high redshift galaxies, and that's what the yellow and gray horizontal bands are, all right? So now we have a third parameter, the escape fraction of ultraviolet photons, all right? And let's ask, given the observations of the mean free path and the populations, what escape fraction will be required, all right, to reionize the universe by redshift of six? or almost reanalyze the universe by redshift of six actually. So the, the top line, which is black, shows what happens if you assume an escape fraction of 10%, all right? And it does not intersect with the two sets of observations because you do not get enough ionizing photons to finish the job. Now, 10% is already a large escape fraction by obs obser observer standards, right? It's about 5% or, or smaller usually. So, but what we need to do to get to reconcile it with the other observations is increase it by a factor of another factor of four to 40%. So we have to assume that galaxies at redshift of six are far better at getting ionizing photons out than any of the populations that we can study in detail. And that's uncomfortable, right? So it says that galaxies at these early times are not working the way we expected that they would, right? Now, in reality, we don't know which of our parameters is breaking. Okay, it could be any of them, just using the escape fraction as an example. Um, but by combining these measurements of reionization in the IGM with the galaxy luminosity function, right, we're getting a lot closer to, to finding out um, how these interesting sources are working. Okay, so that's sort of a proof of concept of how this, this idea will work. But um, we want to do much better than that and, and be more, much more precise. So fortunately, in, this, in the coming years, um, we, we hope to see a whole lot of activity. As I'm sure you all know, JWST, um, well, you may not know, it reached L2 and in its final orbit um, a couple of hours ago. So it is there and it is deploying. And so hopefully, kind of by this time next year, we'll start to have some very early data. And JWST will basically be able to do at redshift of 12 what HST has done at redshift of 8. That's the kind of a way to think about it and learn a lot about um, the environments of the galaxies that we're seeing, which are going to be important for understanding feedback. Um, so my student Adam Trapp has been studying that recently. <laughs>
right? The other way um, that we hope to do this, or another way at least, is the 21 centimeter line of neutral hydrogen, the hyperfine transition. So this is the spin flip transition, okay, between the proton and an electron and produces a photon with a rest wavelength of 21 centimeters. It's an extraordinarily weak transition, but before the universe was reionized, uh, there was a, an awful lot of neutral hydrogen around. And so we hope we can absorb, observe this signal in the near future. And that will be extremely powerful, okay? The most important thing to keep in mind is that the, the, this is a line, so it produces a 21 centimeter photon, but that photon then has to propagate to us. And as it does so, it redshifts. And that means that if a photon is produced, you know, in the very early phases of the cosmic dawn, it will redshift more by the time it gets to us than one produced at the end of reionization. And so we can actually separate out where all these photons come from. And in principle, we could make a movie like the one we're showing here of how the whole process unfolded, okay? Unfortunately, it is a very hard observation to do, okay? So there are three basic challenges to, to observing this signal. The first is the frequencies you end up with after redshifting are kind of 50 to 200 megahertz, which is a regime of the spectrum heavily used by people, right? FM radios is right smack in the middle of that. The second problem is the ionosphere, which is refractive at all of these frequencies and absorbs the lower frequencies entirely. So you have to get out from that. And then the third problem is that it, this is not the only astrophysical signal that is being produced at low frequencies. The uh, most, the brightest is actually the synchrotron radiation produced by cosmic rays in our galaxy. And that foreground is about 10,000 to 100,000 times brighter than the signal that we're looking for. So in absolute terms, the 21 centimeter signal from the cosmic dawn is not hard to see, all right? It's actually brighter than the CMB in, well, tens of your units, but, um, but you have to pick it out against this hugely bright foreground. And that's the real challenge. The, both the terrestrial foreground and the physical foreground. So there are kind of two solutions to doing this. Um, one is to go somewhere isolated, at least, where at least you can avoid the terrestrial problem. Um, and so I will tell you shortly about a telescope in the Crew Desert in South Africa that takes that approach. The more ambitious solution spearheaded by Jack has been to use the lunar environment. So if you put your radio telescope on the far side of the moon, the moon itself blocks out any terrestrial interference. And of course, there's no ionosphere to deal with. So you overcome that problem, which is especially important at the lower frequencies. All right. So before I talk about any particular instruments, I want to give an overview of what this signal can actually do. So I'm going to plot now the um, a very simple version of it, which is let's imagine that we average the 21 centimeter emission over the entire sky. Right. So we're getting the average uh, emission or absorption from the universe, but at each slice in time, because those correspond to different observed frequencies. Okay. So the y-axis here is the brightness of that signal. Now, wherever we look in the universe, the cosmic microwave background is there. So we're actually measuring the brightness relative to the CMB. And so zero on this curve is, this, is the same temperature as the CMB. And so we can't see it. Um, negative means it's colder than the CMB and it absorbs CMB light. Positive means it's emits relative to it. All right, and then we're gonna go from early times at the left to late times at the right. This first part that I'm showing you is from redshifts before the first stars even formed. So the dark ages, as I referred to them before, which in, in this regime, you're able to study sort of sophisticated cosmology, um, uh, dark matter models, stuff like that, because we, we think we understand the universe very well before stars come. So any deviations from that are very interesting. At this time, the universe is cold. So we see it in absorption, but it, if you follow this curve, it's going towards zero. All right, as the dark ages come to an end, um, and because the, the universe is getting less dense and the, the 21 centimeter line goes into equilibrium with the CMB. But that equilibrium is broken once the first stars form. All right, so the first star, the UV light from the first stars travels to the universe and basically um, resets the 21 centimeter signal uh, so that you get absorption again. The universe is still very cold at this time. Um, from this UV light. But shortly after these first stars form, we're going to end up with remnants of these massive stars that are black holes. If those black holes are able to accrete, they're going to produce X-rays, right, which can travel through the universe and heat the gas, okay? The gas is really cold, so it doesn't take a lot of X-rays to do significant heating. And so pretty quickly, you get the gas hotter than the CMB, 
Um, and then you get enough ionizing photons forming or uh, produced in the universe for reionization to get going. And in reionization, you get rid of your neutral hydrogen and the signal fades away, right? So this, uh, what I'm showing here, right, is all made up. It's a very simple model. Um, but the main point is that there are these different radiation fields, not just reionization, but other aspects of early star formation that we can observe with the 21 centimeter line. Right. Here's another view of that. Okay, so that was, remember, that average across the entire sky. In reality, all of these things are produced by discrete sources. And so it's interesting to look and see what kind of structures are going to grow in the intergalactic medium. So this is a slice through a numerical simulation of how this process unfolds. We are going to be starting during the dark ages, and so you won't see much action for this first bit. Right? But around a redshift to 40, it's all going to turn blue. And that's when those first stars flood the universe with ultraviolet light, make it absorbing. And then the black holes heat it. That's the red. Okay. And then these black blobs are the ionized bubbles growing up okay, and destroying your signal. So these are the three radiation backgrounds that we want to measure with the 21 centimeter line. And again, we're going to then combine those overall measurements with the galaxies that we can see, the bright ones, and figure out what the faint guys that we can't see are doing. Okay. Now, I said in principle, we can make movies like this. Unfortunately, with that whopping synchrotron foreground, uh, we're not going to be able to do that in the near future, or maybe even the far future. I don't know. Instead, we're talking about measuring statistics these days. So this uh, on the right now, I'm showing a statistic called the power spectrum. I'm not going to get into the de details of it. I just want you to see that it is wiggling around a lot as we go through these different phases. And so by measuring the th even crude statistics, we can actually also learn about you know, how these different transitions are playing out. OK, so the good news is we can, there, there's a lot that, of physics in the 21 centimeter signal. The bad news is that means we need a lot more sophisticated models to make predictions about it. OK, so we need the ultraviolet emission to see when the stars are turning on. We need the black holes to see when heating is taking place. I haven't even mentioned that if these, source, that these are radio sources as well, that introduces other fluctuations in the universe. OK, so you introduce a whole bunch of new parameters, and you end up with, even if you're trying to model the galaxies as simply as you can, a long list of things to worry about. Um, so I'm not going to talk about all of these today. I just want to focus your attention on one of these um, parameters, which is the way in which black hole heating takes place. So uh, the idea here is that gas is accreting onto stellar remnant black holes, all right? And as it accretes, it gets heated and produces X-rays, and those X-rays are going to go out into the universe and heat it. And we have one parameter, parameters in here describing basically how efficiently that heating happens. OK, so despite the difficulty of doing this measurement, there are a number of experiments trying to do so. I'm involved with one called the Hydrogen Epoch of Reionization Array, which is in the Crew Desert in South Africa. And this is a Google Earth zoom in from this summer of what the telescope looks like. So we're zooming in on the Crew Desert now. It is a site where the part of the square kilometer array will eventually go. And this is what Hera looks like as of uh, I think it was late July. Um, it is an interferometer. It is going to be about, well, I should say about 337 dishes when it is fully constructed. It would have been done by now, but COVID. So, but I think probably by the end of the year, it will be constructed. You can see already that the sort of physical infrastructure is in place, uh, but it's a matter of hooking up all the antennas. Um, and it's in this weird hexagonal design because it is purpose built to measure the statistics of the 21 centimeter line. All right, and so it's not good at imaging this guy. It is good at measuring statistics. And one of the nice things about working with an interferometer is even when it is only partially built, much like the Death Star, um, you can still use it. And so this summer, we released our first upper limits on the 21 centimeter signal at redshifts of about 8 and about 10. Uh, so this is the power spectrum that I showed you before. Again, don't have time to get into the details of it. But uh, basically, all of these points are just upper limits. Uh, there are still systematics in here that prevent us from actually making a measurement. But we know that the signal is no higher than shown here. Uh, 
And this was done with only a fraction of the final instrument. So 39 antennae observing over a couple of weeks, basically. We are already observing the next set of data, which is about four, or not observing, analyzing the next set of data, which is about four times as big, and we hope will give correspondingly better limits. Already, even with this small fraction of the experiment, these are the best upper limits on the fluctuations in the spin flip signal to date. Okay, now remember um, there are all those parameters that go into predicting what the signal looks like, okay? But the way to make a signal really strong is to have strong absorption, right? Because the colder the universe is, the bigger and bigger the signal gets. So crudely, you can think of these upper limits as saying the universe must be hotter than some certain amount or else we get stronger fluctuations than we see. Right? And in order to test that, we put these limits through no fewer than four different models of what the 21 centimeter signal should look like. Okay, And one of those was a very simple analytic model. Two of them are independent, very complicated galaxy-based models. And one of them is somewhere in between what we call phenomenological, where we're basically trying to avoid making assumptions about galaxies, but trying to kind of model the geometry. All of them agreed that the universe must have been heated by redshift of eight, all right? If there were no heating from galaxies or some other process, right, then the universe would just cool adiabatically as it expands and its temperature would be at the edge of this red band. Um, the black, the dark curves are our limits from these different um, uh, models and all of them, right, are above that adiabatic cooling regime. So, uh, what that heating is, we can't say for sure, right? But this is the first indication that the universe was heated um, at this time. Uh, I will mention that one of those models, the sort of medium one, was created by former Colorado graduate student Jordan Maraca, all right? And uh, just put on Astro Peach last week if you want to check it out. Okay. Um, as I said, this one way to heat the universe at this time is through X-rays following accretion. And so the interesting input to galaxy physics that comes from this limit is that we must have this, X that how much X-ray heating we have, right? And you can basically parameterize this as the amount of X-rays you get for unit star formation. If the heating were like local X-ray sources, it would be at this vertical black line. If it is due to low metallicity X-ray binaries, it would be bigger at the dot dashed line. And that second one turns out to be more consistent with our results. The errors right now are very big, right? We can't actually rule anything out, but it's really interesting to see that we're getting toward a point where we can make statements like that. All right, last thing then, what about the really exciting physics, which is observing the first stars themselves? Remember, we need to go to very high redshifts uh, to do this, where the 21 centimeter line is especially challenging because of the Earth's ionosphere and stuff like that. So this is where, uh, but, okay, that these early stars can have a huge effect on the signal. All right. Um, so this is going back to the sky average signal. The black dashed curve is the signal we predict based on normal galaxies. All right. And all of the other curves are how this changes if we introduce different kinds of population three stars. So it can have a very dramatic effect on the signal. In fact, in all of these cases, it does, right? And so by looking at early times, we can, even though these things are so rare, their collective effects have, have powerful implications for the 21 centimeter line. But we're talking about looking at redshift of 20, which is very difficult from the ground. And so this is where our ambitious solution, the far side of the moon comes in, right? And there's sort of an incremental program building toward eventually trying to make those measurements. So this spring, Rolls will land on the lunar surface, and this will, amongst other things, start to measure the ENM environment um, and how these low frequency telescopes might function. A few years from now, Lucy uh, will hopefully land on the far side of the moon. And I believe the current plan is to try to use it to measure at least some parts of the sky average spectrum. And then Jack um, and Greg Hallinan are leading an effort to for a concept called Farside, which would be a rollout um, low frequency radio telescope on the far side of the moon to do both this kind of cosmology um, and exoplanet studies. So that's a sort of probe class mission um, that was also mentioned by the decadal survey.
So that is looking forward to hopefully the not too distant future. All right, so just to sum up, um, right now it looks like bright galaxies work just as we might expect, but um, there are suggestions that the faint galaxies aren't working quite the same because reionization is hard to finish. And of course, there are many reasons we expect these galaxies to be very interesting. In the near future, we'll get JWST uh, measurements that will improve our understanding of bright galaxies dramatically. We're already starting to learn from the 21 centimeter limits and those are gonna improve in the near term. And the lunar 21 centimeter observatories are pushing us toward being able to measure the first stars in dark ages. Um, I hope in the not distant future, although also not next year. All right, so I will stop there. Uh, thank you. Steve, thank you very much for a very comprehensive um, tour through the first galaxies. Uh, let me suggest we have a couple minutes for some questions for people to go ahead and raise their hands electronically. Uh, and um, I'll call on them and have, um, have you unmute to ask your question. So the first hand I see is Mike Scholl. Mike, why don't you um, go ahead and unmute and ask Steve. Yeah, uh, thanks for that rapid tour through a lot of work. I had a question about your parameterization of mean free path, which you could get just by having more absorbers, mean number of absorbers, versus what many of us would use in the past, which is clumping, which is measuring the n squared effect of recombination. Could, could you elaborate on the differences between those? Um, so I think they are compatible. Um, the kind of picture that I have is goes back to the Moral de Escude um, stuff in, in early 2000s, which is we've got these sort of density fluctuations in the intergalactic medium. And if we ionize a region, then the denser any given clump is, the more it is going to recombine. Um, and so you basically can divide the universe into a part that stays ionized and a part that recombines fast enough to be optically thick. And so I think the mean free path is sort of just another way of parameterizing how many of these clumps you have in the intergalactic medium. It's kind of a physics free way, right? It's just a parameterization, um, but the picture in my head is, is similar to the old clumping arguments. Hmm. Okay, I, I would have thought there's some di differences between the mean and the fluctuations, but that's a longer discussion, I suspect. I'm sure there are, yeah. <laughs> Not sure that the models are good enough to, uh, to, to worry about them yet. Okay, yes. thank you. So next up, Andrew. Uh, great talk, Steve. You didn't mention globular clusters. Do they play any role at all in your modeling? Um, that's a very good question, right? So globular clusters appear to be very, a population of very old stars with a fairly large mass today, right? Or a, the mass budget of globular clusters is fairly large today. And you can do some simple estimates um, if, you know, you, if you assume that they also formed with the normal massive stars that have gone by now, but were there at redshift of eight or whatever they, they formed, then you would get actually a lot of ionizing photons from them. So they are not explicitly included in our model, though I have had an undergraduate thinking about, you know, if they're, for, one, one way you could think of it is um, we've got this bursty behavior from the, the feedback delay and that's the kind of thing that one could imagine um, in a very hand wavy way forming globular clusters. So she's thinking if that were the case, um, do we kind of get the right number of globular clusters today? Um, and you can make it work pretty easily. And um, the other thing I think that's going to be very important is what are the, what does a globular cluster actually look like when it's forming? And there's been some arguments in the literature of whether we have seen you know, potential globular clusters forming or not at redshift of, in, in faint redshift of seven lens galaxies. I think that's pretty unsettled, but JWST will probably go a good way toward answering those questions. So I, I agree they are important. They are very unknown, so we have not explicitly included them. Could they have been much larger in the past and they've been stripped or evaporated or whatever? Um, I don't know enough about their dynamical state today. I think the assumption is that they've lost a factor of a few in stellar mass, but I don't think they, I don't think most people think they've lost much more than that, but whether it's possible, I, I'm not sure. Mm 
Steve, uh, just a, a quick question about HERA. So these first uh, limits that we saw, I think were from only about 30, 32 telescopes or so. Uh, and of course, we've got the array is going to be much larger. So when do you think the next bolus of um, data will be emerging? And what do you think you'll be able to uh, do with those additional data in terms of uh, constraining the signal? So the next thing that happens um, will be relatively short term. The data that from which the existing limit came was actually a subset of that first observing campaign. It, it, the, the team kind of took the cleanest part and ran through the analysis of that, while in parallel, other parts of the team are working on improving the overall analysis. So there was sort of a, a larger set that one could analyze. Now both parts of that are done. And so the analysis is being done on this larger, but still early, it's still, I think the same number of antennas, but a lot much longer observing time. Um, so that will be an incremental advance and that uh, I expect by this summer, we'll have results on that, but that's not gonna really change qualitatively anything, I, I don't think. The next big observing run um, was, uh, significantly larger, but they are not, that is um, not yet at a point where we're talking about limits yet. So maybe in a year that would be analyzed okay. or something like that. All right. Yeah. We know these things are, are take a lot of time and the, uh, both the data analysis and interpretation are very complex. So um, we're out of time at this point. Um, although I do want to say that tomorrow we've set aside an hour with Steve at two o'clock uh, mountain time um, and uh, students and others are invited uh, to really just continue this Q&A and, brain, and brainstorming with Steve. So I want to invite everybody uh, and uh, we'll send out a link uh, to that um, session, that Zoom session for everybody. So. Once again, Steve, we, we really like to thank you for uh, joining us today and kicking off our colloquium for this semester. So we're going to give you one more virtual round of applause. Thanks for inviting me. Thank Sorry, you. I couldn't be there in person. All right. Thanks, all. Great. Thanks, Steve.